The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between Thomas and Nadia, who are waiting at the airport. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Where have you been, Nadia? Browsing in the bookshop. What took you so long? You said you were only going to be away five minutes. I was only gone for a quarter of an hour. Well, it seemed much longer than that. Did you buy anything? I was tempted to get the latest novel by Dan Brown, but it's quite heavy and I'd have to carry it around with me. If I could have found a crossword puzzle book, I'd have bought it. But in the end, I was attracted to a front-page article in today's issue of the New York Times. Is that all you bought, then? Yes. Look, why don't you read the business section while I catch up on the news, and then we can swap? I'd rather have the entertainment section. Are you looking for anything in particular? I just thought they might have a review in there of that new play that opened on Broadway yesterday. The drama about the awfully cruel pirate? Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Hmm, I wonder how good it is. Actually, I was thinking of the new comedy. The one about the physician. Dr Hunter. That's the one. Well... When I was in the bookshop, I overheard a couple talking about it, and they said it was fantastic, not in the least bit boring. They especially liked the actor who played the main part. Very smooth, apparently. Lots of fun, then. Well, according to those two, they thought it was hilarious. Ooh, we'll have to make a point of seeing it when we get back. Definitely. We didn't have time for breakfast, and I'm hungry. Do you fancy a coffee and a muffin? Sounds like a good idea. And how will you have your coffee today? Long and black as usual. I think I might have something different this morning. What? You don't mean a flat white or some other milky one? Oh, I don't know. I want something to perk me up. An espresso, short and black with sugar. Perfect. Will that be with a chocolate muffin or a berry muffin? I'll try to stay off chocolate. The berry sounds healthier. And I'll have a plain one with butter. Won't be long. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Here you are. Mind the coffee. It's really hot. Thank you. I'm really ready for this. Have you thought about what we should see when we get to London? The Tower, of course. I've always wanted to get a look at the Crown Jewels. That is where they keep the jewels, isn't it? I think so. And what about the wheel? I hear it's quite extraordinary. I'm not that keen on the wheel. Do you want to ride on it? No way. Well, let's leave it out of the itinerary then. OK. So, do we do the tower first? Yes, that's the idea. And then we absolutely have to go to Westminster. Really? Yes. Look, it's not going to cost us anything. And I promised my sister I'd take photos there. Well, if you insist. I do. Oh, did you know the British Museum is free to the public? Not just residents, but tourists as well. Well, I did know that, but I was hoping we wouldn't have to spend time in any museums. We've only got three days in all, and it'll take at least one whole day to go through the museum. 
Well, let's say we leave it till day three and see how you feel then. OK. I can't argue with that. And Buckingham Palace? I suppose you've promised lots of photos of that as well, have you? Well, no, not really. But we can't say we've been to London and haven't seen the Queen's Palace. I guess not. And there's the added benefit that it won't cost anything as well. Oh, Thomas, it's not that I'm afraid of spending money. It's just that I want to see all the traditional sites first. Good. I'm glad that's sorted. Listen, I think they just called our flight. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a counsellor from health services talking about confidence and goal setting. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello, I'm Jo from Health Services and I'm pleased to be here talking to you today. You've come here today to learn more about gaining confidence and setting goals. How many of you are truly positive thinkers? Positive thinking is the key to confidence. It doesn't matter whether you are playing a sports match facing an interview or preparing for an exam. If you apply positive thinking, you will gain confidence. This is the secret. Positive thought patterns. Positivity leads to confidence, which, in turn, will optimize your performance. What is the one simple mental strategy that all confident people have in common? They concentrate on success. But don't they ever fail? Don't they make mistakes? What happens when things go wrong? The crucial difference is that they don't dwell on failure. Everybody makes mistakes. I mean, how else do we learn? Rather than giving up or becoming depressed, the best strategy is to register the mistake, note what went wrong, and determine what would have been a better way to act or what could have been done differently in order to achieve a more successful outcome. Then move on. Yes, erase the negative emotions. Allow those memories of defeat, frustration or dissatisfaction to fade and move forward. Negativity erodes confidence. You need to put aside your disappointments and focus on successful outcomes. Oh, it's not that easy, I can hear you saying. Well, no, it's not easy to forget failure but no one ever fails completely, so congratulate yourself on the areas where you did do well. Mentally replay the best bits, even if they're only a small part. Now, there are two more things you need to do. Firstly, rehearsal. Yes, you heard me. Rehearsal. Surely only actors in a play need to rehearse their parts? No. The truth is, we all need to rehearse. This is a surefire way to build confidence. Before the match, presentation, the exam, or whatever, imagine yourself performing successfully in that particular situation. And here's the second tip. Look confident. That will always give you an extra physiological advantage. So, you can see that mind and body work together on this. You have to think and act positively. 
let's talk a bit more about how to look confident. If you have to overcome a challenge, get rid of that anxious expression and rigid posture, those downcast eyes and nervous gestures. Even if you don't feel very self-assured, you can still give the appearance of confidence. Stand tall, hold your head up, make full eye contact, and keep an open expression. Replace the frown with a smile if you can manage it. And those hunched shoulders? Relax those shoulder muscles. If you need to, take a deep breath and stretch to release pent-up anxiety and tension. What if you have to make a difficult phone call, for example? Nobody can actually see you, so does it matter what you look like? Yes, it does. Practicing positive body language will help you cross the threshold into a confident mood. Before we move on to talk about goal setting, it may surprise you to know that once you have set a goal in life, the brain responds with a burst of activity, which we experience as, that's right, happiness. And what happens when the goal is achieved? Yes, there is another burst of activity and another feeling of happiness. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. As you can see, the recipe for a happy life is to maintain a positive attitude and keep setting and achieving your goals. So, whatever your goal, whatever it is that you're aiming for, a new job, losing weight, giving up smoking, graduation, you need an appropriate and by appropriate, I mean achievable goal. That's the first step. The next thing to consider is motivation. How do you get going? Well, it's more likely to motivate you if you think of the rewards of success rather than focus on failure or what you might lose. So, you need to establish your incentives. After that, you'll have to work out the various stages and phases that you'll need to go through along the way and prepare for each one of them. If you're not naturally motivated, keep the targets small and achievable. But it really is important to ensure you collect the resources to accomplish the various steps. If you have performed that particular task before, you may already have the resources, or at least know where to get them from. If not, Ask someone who has already succeeded. When you have got this far, the next stage is obvious. Yes, you have to take the first step. That's not quite all there is to it, though. The final thing is to remember to keep track of what you've accomplished. In other words, be sure to maintain a progress log. That way, you can look back at your previous small successes and watch your progress along the way to achieving your goal. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two senior students who have to organize a competition for the University Open Day. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27.
Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hi, Grant. What sort of competition do you think we should organize? Well, Claire, the Open Day Committee was pretty clear on that. It must be something with youth appeal. That makes sense. After all, most of the visitors will have just left high school. Yeah, so I was thinking technology. Do you mean something which uses the latest technology, like an iPod? Something like that, but a bit more expensive, maybe. What about the latest iPhone? I'm saving up for one right now. Let's make it an iPad. I wish I'd had a tablet computer when I started university. Yeah, that's a great idea. That should get a lot of our younger visitors interested. Right. Let's go with that, then. Fine. We could go into town now and buy it. I saw great deals advertised at the Rick Smith store. Oh, I don't think we'll have to worry about that. A university purchase order will probably be arranged through the Resources and Supplies section. Well, that's settled, then. What about the competition? Is it going to be a game of skill or a guessing game? Or something else. What do you think would work best? Good question. I don't think it should be anything too hard, or anything that will make the visitors look silly. Some of them have such fragile egos. True. So, something that anyone can do. Nothing competitive, no skill or intelligence involved. That's right. But the main thing is that the contestants have a lot of fun. How do we do that? Well, I was thinking of a popular TV series, science fiction or science fantasy. I don't actually know the difference. Go on. It's a series where in every episode, the main characters step through a portal into another world or another era. What's a portal? It's like a gateway or entrance to something. Okay, I get it. They'll be stepping into the new world of tertiary learning. So somehow we encourage people to step through this portal. Then what? They get their photo taken. Is that all? Not exactly. Let me think. I can't see how that's a competition, unless we pick the best photograph. But there's not much excitement or involvement in that for the participants. Hmm, wait. We don't decide on the winner. I mean, no one person does. We get them, the public, to do it. How? Put all the photos on Facebook, and the one with the most votes wins. I agree. Good idea. But there's just one more thing I'm not clear about. How do we get hold of a portal? I was thinking graduates of the engineering department could construct it as part of their contribution to Open Day. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 28 to 30. How do visitors enter the competition on Open Day? Well, firstly, they have to make their way to the portal photo booth on campus. Okay. A bit like a treasure hunt to start with. Yes. And then they get their photo taken stepping through the portal. And they'll have to write down their details. You know, name, phone number, Email? No, hang on. Let's keep it simple. Just name and email address should do. Then, after, say, the 30th of July, people can visit the university Facebook page and vote for their favorite photo. So the photo with the most votes wins. Yes. I think that should generate quite a bit of interest. What about a cutoff date? Of course. Maybe, um... The most popular photo as of 5 p.m. on the 10th of August will collect the iPad. 
And the winner will be notified by email. And the winning photo will be enlarged and published in full color on the university Facebook page. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a geography lecture on the British Isles. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, I'm glad so many of you have turned out to hear what I have to say today about the British Isles, that area of the Eastern Atlantic that we Americans find so confusing. I'm afraid just looking at a map or a page in the atlas doesn't necessarily explain the geographic terminology. In referring to the British Isles. A word of apology for those of you of Irish descent, that is, those whose ancestors come from Ire, the Republic of Ireland. No matter how geographically accurate the place names that I use today are, some of you will be understandably upset to be included in anything termed British. I have a very useful image that might help you differentiate between the various labels that distinguish the political and geographic reality. Of the so-called British Isles, I want to show you a Venn diagram, which is a mathematical illustration that shows all the possible relationships between sets. Look at this Venn diagram, and you will see that the geographical terminology is in bold, while the political terms are in italics. See here the British Isles in bold and the British Islands in italics. The aim of this lecture. Is to explain the meanings of and relationships among those terms. In geographical terms, you will see that the British Isles is an archipelago made up of the two large islands of Great Britain and Ireland, and including many smaller surrounding islands. Of course, you can't tell from the Venn diagram the true comparative size of these islands. You'll need to look at the map for that. But take my word for it. Great Britain is the largest island of the archipelago, followed by Ireland, which, in reality, geographically, lies to the west, and there are over a thousand smaller islands. Now, in political terms, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is the constitutional monarchy, which includes the island of Great Britain, some small nearby islands. Although not the Isle of Man or the Channel Islands, and the northeastern part of the island of Ireland, thank goodness it is generally shortened to United Kingdom, the UK, Great Britain, or Britain, or even the abbreviation GB. Although none of these are strictly correct, of course. You'd better listen carefully to the next part because I warn you, it is very confusing. Ireland is the name of the sovereign republic occupying the larger part of the island of Ireland, but to distinguish it from the name of the island itself, and most importantly from the other part which belongs to the UK, it is called the Republic of Ireland, or its Irish language name, Eire. That's E I R E, even though Eire directly translates as Ireland. The smaller portion of the island is called Northern Ireland. 
The partition of Ireland took place in 1922, after a great history of struggle that we won't go into here. England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland are legal jurisdictions within the United Kingdom, but Great Britain refers to the countries of England, Wales. And Scotland as a unit. The British Islands contain the United Kingdom, the Channel Islands, made up of Guernsey and Jersey, and Isle of Man, which all have the British monarch as head of state. Interestingly, the Isle of Man, although governed as a British Crown dependency, has its own parliament, but relies on the UK for defence and in matters of external relations. So. You've learned something about the geographical and political confusion surrounding the British Isles. Let's have a look at some of the linguistic confusion. To start with, there isn't an adjective to refer to the United Kingdom, so the term British is generally used. However, that means that citizens of Northern Ireland, although not on the island of Great Britain, still describe themselves as British. Because this reflects their political and cultural identity, Irish, in a political sense, refers to the republic only. So sometimes citizens of Northern Ireland would call themselves Northern Irish as a point of difference. Of course, the Northern in Northern Irish is not completely accurate either, as the most northerly peninsula on the island is in the county of Donegal, which is part of the republic. Okay. We might get in a muddle over the term Irish, but at least Scottish, Welsh, and English should be self-explanatory. Apparently, not to us Americans, and Europeans are often guilty of this too. We often use the term English incorrectly to mean British. I'd have to be the first to admit to calling my Welsh colleague English, which really gets his heckles up. He is Welsh, he tells me, and he may also be British, but he is definitely not English. Just one more thing: what is the British Commonwealth? It's a voluntary association of independent states, many of which were former British colonies. In fact, what was primarily the old British Empire. However, it's no longer known as the British Commonwealth. But is now called the Commonwealth of Nations instead, presumably because current members do not want to remember the old colonial ties. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test.